So good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon to you. Shalom, Simona Elon from Jerusalem. Um, we're Shalom. So pleased. Shalom, Simonetta. Shalom. We're so pleased to have you at Ebraica, the International Cultural Festival here in Rome. And uh, the, the occasion is the publishing of this fantastic book. It, in Italian, it sounds La Casa dell'Acqua, but it's uh, the, the house of endless waters that the, this is the original title. You gave it to it. And um, it's um, published by Guanda, translated by Elena, Elena Leventhal. It's, it's a wonderful book. And um, when I read this book, I really thought that the case of the story of Yoel Bloom, um, in a, an, an Israeli writer um, traveling to Amsterdam, Netherlands, um, and, and then you develop this story in a magnificent, in very, very special way. It's almost a thriller. You can't leave the book. Um, so could we define this story as a second life story, Emuna? Thank you for your question, Simonetta. And I just want to say I'm very happy to meet with you today. And I'm really excited about having my book translated into your beautiful language. I love Italian. I don't understand, of course, but I really love the, love the language and the people and the country. I think of the novel House on Endless Waters as a story of a second life, like you said, in the sense that it is, it is a story of survival and revival a story about the way we look at our identity and about how we find, we find out who we are and what we really want. The main character of, of this novel, uh, Yoel Bloom, is a successful writer, like you said, who thinks he is living his life, his first life, in the best way possible. But then, thanks to the journey into his own history and into his own soul, he can begin a second life in which he is much better connected to his true self as well as to his loved ones. So in a way he gets a second chance for a new life based of course on the one he had before, but totally new, totally second, like you said. Thank you. Um, the, you know, you're coming Amuna from from a life of scholars and rabbis, uh, and you are married to, unfortunately, very late uh, Rabbi Elon. And um, you know, all your life you have lived through and within Jewish life, Jewish culture, Jewish value. Um, does Judaism give us tools to change our life? to correct our life, and even to experience a new life eventually. I believe so, yes. Judaism offers constant teshuvah. The Hebrew word teshuvah means repentance, correction, renewal, and a person is, is supposed to want to be a Baal Teshuvah all his life, to be someone who constantly corrects and repents and renews himself and his life. But first and foremost, the word Teshuvah means return. And this is what Judaism offers us, to repent and correct by returning. Gaining a new life is always, in Jewish thought, a result of coming back to your old life, to your sources, your individual source, as well as your family history and your nation's history, your nation's origin. Returning to your origin, to your true self, is the condition for advancement. It may seem like a paradox, but uh, as we read in the last verse of the Book of Lamentations, Eicha, Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuva, Chadesh Yamenu Kekedem. 
bring us back to you, our Lord. Renew our days as in the past. It sounds strange, right? We're asking our Lord uh, Elohim to renew our days. Renew them as they were in the past, which is in, in Judaism, it's not the opposite. Because in Judaism, renewal comes from returning to the old. Advancement can happen only if you acknowledge what is behind you. And the condition for one's growth is being acquainted with one's roots. Actually, in Hebrew, the word forward, kadima, comes from the word kedim or kodim, which mean before. So advancement is always by going backwards. It's the only way to really advance. It's the only way, it's the only way to really renew your life and live that second life that we are talking about today. Thank you. And, and to stay with the book, um, which speaks of that twilight zone of the time, just the beginning of the Holocaust, the beginning of the persecutions. Um, and the book is, as we said in the Netherlands, in Holland. Um, so this is a book who speaks about the Shoah. You know, we, we prefer to, to speak, to, to, to define that time with the Hebrew word Shoah, which is different than Holocaust. Well, even in that completely black time, those terrible years for the Jews, people chose, Jews always chose for life. And this is a great lesson from the survivors as well. But, uh, and it's also a great lesson in the book. So since we're speaking about second life, even in that time when life was almost impossible, even the first life, not even a second life, uh, what is the lesson in the Shah? We're learning the legacy of the survivors, the legacy of those who wrote about it, the legacy of our brothers who really wanted to give us a message they always gave us a message of life. Can, can you speak about this? I think the way you asked it is really wonderful because uh, that's the key. What you said in your question is actually the key to the answer. I just want to, uh, to mention that, you, uh, as you know, after reading the book, the word Shoah does not appear in the story at all. Actually, the Dutch, until today, they call that time the war. Because you know, Holland knew no other war for the last 300 years or more. That was the only war they knew, the Second World, World War, in which uh, the Nazis um, conquered um, Amsterdam and most of Holland. And um, in the present of the story of this book, the people and the Jews included do not yet know that this will be called the, the Holocaust or the Shoah one day. They are so um, they are so deep in just trying to survive one day after another, so successful on, on one hand in keeping their normality, keeping their optimism. On the other hand, they are, we know that they are too optimistic. The way they, go, they went and enlisted as Jews, and then enlisted, uh, they gave in lists of all their property, all the money they have, their bank accounts, their safes, the codes to their safes. They gave everything that the, that the authorities demanded them to do, they did because they never believed for one minute that this was leading them to a Shoah. They believed that if you do whatever the law tells you to do, everything will be okay. And even when they heard about what was happening in already in the East, in Poland, in Germany, they did not for one second believe that these 
things could happen in Holland. They kept saying, no, not in Holland. I, I saw it again and again, you know, in, in testimonies recorded by people who survived. And it's, it's amazing to see how they were sure that they would survive because they are law abiding citizens of this wonderful country, Holland. I think that's also what, uh, what called me there, what, what made me write the story uh, in, uh, that it happens in Holland because I didn't have a connection to Holland before writing this book. But when I knew more, the more I knew about the story of Dutch Jewry during the Second World War, the more I understood this is a story about every man, about every Jew and about every human being. And I must uh, bring myself to, to be able to, to write it. And um, I, I hope I did, I did it okay because I felt all the time a great responsibility lying on my, on my shoulders. So the main character, as we said, is Joel Bloom, but he is the writer writing about his mother, the woman who, who raised him and who was his mother. Her name is Sonia. And I, sh I think Sonia is really uh, the main way to answer the question you asked about the message. Choosing life is really the main legacy, learning to build, being able to build a house and a family on the endless waters of the universe, on top of the abyss constantly lurking under the, these waters, under the ground. And this, you can feel it very strongly when you walk the streets of Amsterdam, you see the waters, you can feel the abyss lurking underneath. You know what happened there. And to think that people like Sonia, like imaginary Sonia, but she represents many real people, could, after everything they endured there, come out of it and still build a house, a new house on these endless waters and raise a family, yes? Sonia, after the war, I mean, after she gets out of it, she comes to Eretz Israel. She comes to Israel with two children, Yoel and his sister Neti, and raises them here, here in Israel, all by herself, as normally as she can, living with what she has rather than sitting and lamenting on what she lost. I think people like her are really um, great symbols of life that I wish we could learn something from them. You know, sometimes when I was a child, when I was young in Israel, uh, we used to look at um, Holocaust survivors who lost their minds, you know, and who, who uh, lived in the streets when they came to Israel. They couldn't bring, the, bring themselves to live inside a house because they couldn't believe in walls anymore and in laws and in stability. And they, they, they were regarded by us as crazy people. But now I understand that the real crazy people are those who did build houses, new houses and new families. They are the crazy ones. We are kind of a crazy nation, uh, we the Jews, that after everything we went through, we are still able to build not only personal family houses, but to build this national house, the state of Israel, and believe it is possible to survive on these endless waters who keep, who keep uh, storming all the time under us and around us. Well, before extending this concept of under, endless waters under the state of Israel, I just would like to say two things. This book, we spoke so much about the Shoah now, but this book, I wouldn't, I couldn't define it a book on the Holocaust. It's really, I, I say this for the readers. It's a very universal book. And the story of Sonia is a universal story of, of you know, wanting to be with a children, a mother and the children through life. So so I was not surprised that the, the, the word Holocaust or Shah 
is not quoted in this book because it's much beyond, it goes beyond like the waters. And by the way, what you said about um, Holland is very, very parallel to what happened here in, in Italy and especially in Rome. It is very true that we had you know, the fascist regime, but at the same time, the Jews of Italy and the Jews of Rome being here 2,000 and 200 years really never thought that this could happen to them. So while reading the book, I truly identified with the story also on this point of view. But let's go back, mm -hmm. let's continue this conversation. When you said, you, you spoke so beautifully. I just want to add to what you said now, if I may, that I really, sure. whenever I whenever I, I asked myself what, while writing the book, you know, I, I did, of, of course, a lot of research and, read and listened and and but still I thought that maybe I am not the right person to to write about this because I don't really know how it was to be there at that time so how can I write about it I believe a writer can can tell only about his own experience so how can I and the answer I always gave myself was that I was not there at that time but I know what it is like to be a mother I know what it is like to be a daughter of parents. I know about relationships between, um, between parents and children. And this is the main theme of the book, actually. The question of how much can a parent devote himself or herself to the child? And do we sometimes devote ourselves so much that we allow ourselves to decide what is the best thing for our child like happens in this book, I don't want to make any spoilers, but you know, sometimes a mother can be so devoted that she deprives her child of something that he needs, thinking because she be, she thinks this she's doing the best thing for for the child. So these questions are questions that I do know as a mother, as a daughter, as a grandmother, and uh, the and also the the feeling that sometimes life is bigger than us. Sometimes things happen to us that we have no control over. And what do we do with it? How do we cope with all these things that are not in our hands, that are much larger and, and, um, and out of reach? And I think this is what the book is really about, these things, as well as it is about that, that historical period. It is also about all these things that, that each and every one of us um, as an expert I, on. And absolutely, and if I can add, there is a lot of beauty in this book. It's, you know, when you. the beauty of Amsterdam, the beauty, the eyes are never closed in front of the beauty. And this is something very, very deep and very strong. And, and if you allow me, you. it's also the greatness, you are such a, an author, a writer, and nobody would think that you had never been in Amsterdam before. So the ability in your language. I have been there. I have been there, but I'm not Dutch by origin. Uh, and uh, whenever I hear uh, people, especially Dutch readers, when the book was translated into Dutch, and also Israelis who are children of Dutch, um, of people who came from Holland, when they tell me that it seems as if I was there at the, and I know and I experienced these things, I really feel uh, that I received a gift. Well, you are a famous scholar. Famous scholar. And, uh, I'm glad that uh, this book has been finally, that you have been finally translated into Italian. So we can introduce you. you also to the Italian audience. But let's go back um, to what you were saying before. You know, these travel waters and they're also um, it, with inside the, the, you know, the, the, the people of Israel also inside the state of Israel, this amazing um, story of creating a state. So we are slowly getting out of a very, very difficult year. And um, in, in Israel has experience as all the countries in the world, the pandemic, and recently has experienced a war. 
and uh, you know we are the news are giving us a kind of information because uh, we have a new president but oh, uh, maybe a new government, but without so much getting into politics, uh, because this conversation is 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 with an author, is with. Uh, but I, you know, how the people of Israel reacted to this year, such a difficult year, and um, are you feeling in a way that this is also a new life coming through? What? What is happening? What is the feeling now? You're sitting in Jerusalem and I'm sitting in Rome. I wish I knew. I still say <laughs> the, the unknown is still, uh, you know, uh, greater than, than what we do know about what is uh, pending, what is coming. And uh, I think the main feeling of all of us uh, here, as well as uh, I'm sure it was the same in Italy, was that uh, this is really unbelievable. When we saw the pandemic, when we saw what happened to, the, to our life and to the world during uh, the year of the pandemic, my main feeling was, no, no, this is impossible. This is surrealistic. This cannot be happening. You know, so in a way it was maybe similar to, to the times of the Shoah, in the, only in that aspect, I'm not comparing of course, anything can't be compared to the Shoah or to anything else. But um, this was the main feeling here that, uh, that what, how can we cope with this totally new situation that we can't even believe is really happening? Um, the pandemic was of course very difficult for us, though I believe you Italians know about these difficulties even more. We, we saw the news about Italy and we were praying for, for you, for your people uh, to overcome. It's, it really looked um, very uh, bad. Then we went here through another episode uh, of our never ending war of survival. Uh, every, every war, every new uh, war or, or, um, or um, you know, uh, this this time it was it wasn't called a war in Hebrew; it was called uh, mivza, kind of um, a one-time. Yes, um, we understand that these are not one uh, uh, different wars. It's the same one hundred year or uh, or more. Who knows? War of our return to of the Jews' return, the Jewish return the return of the Jewish people to its homeland after 2000 years. It cannot be simple. And it is, um, it forces us to be very strong in our belief that we came here in order to stay here. And this is really our land and we should, and we try. I promise you that even I, who am considered to be right wing, I do my best throughout the years uh, in politics and in writing um, uh, in newspaper columns that I write. I do my best to see how we can do this without causing with uh, pain to the Palestinians who live here in the same country with us. And uh, now the new government that we are trying to establish here for the first time it has in it representatives of the Arab citizens in Israel who regard themselves as Palestinians, no less than though than the Arabs in the West Bank or in Gaza. And I am very happy about this. And I, I'm, I, I wrote um, an article in the newspaper on uh, this last um, weekend um, supporting the new government and supporting the fact that not only is it a, a national unity government concer concerning different kinds of Israeli Jews who are part of it, but finally we are admitting the fact that one fifth of the Israeli population inside the, the, the 67 bo um, border, what is, well, as we define it, are Arabs and we are and we live with them. 
and we live, we, we, we are, they are part of our lives in all aspects. We can see it in hospitals, in uh, where they work side by side with Israel, with Jewish doctors and nurses. We see it in many other places as well. And I really hope that this new government will be able to be established and to start uh, helping the state heal the wounds of these last two years in which we, besides the pandemic and the wars, we were also um, running from one election to the other, you know, four recurring elections in two years with a very severe uh, political crisis that I hope is about to end. I really pray for that. Absolutely. It's also a unity government, so let's hope for the best. Yes, you mentioned Amen. that you write about news, newspapers, and I'm glad you're, you're, you're not only an author and a scholar, you're teaching, you're teaching on Judaism, Hasidism, and, um, and, and, you, and you're writing on newspapers and also strongly work for the women's cause in Israel, um, which is a very important everywhere and also in, in Israel, of course. Um, yes. It's so much part of our life in this time of history. It's, it's important also to protect the, the role of women's, women. Uh, but you also, you know, the mother of six, um, uh, children and um, as you mentioned at the beginning and you this is a big part of your life and um, you know it's not a secret that one of your children um, Ori is also one of the inventors of of a series for which most of the Italians are passionate became passionate I think all over the world but in Italy I'm speaking about Stiesel and um, you know, so many people question and ask, how is it possible? Of course, we have to remember that the series Stiesel is about ultra-Orthodox families and um, your legacy is more liberal Orthodox um, and uh, you know, liberal religious um, Israeli and uh, and so this, these have all kinds, we know that Judaism has all kinds of different uh, ways. And this is also the beauty, the beauty of it, that you can leave it with all kinds. But so many people question, how is it possible that the values and life in, 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 a, in such a group of people uh, can be, can touch the heart of people belonging to other religions, to other groups, to other realities, other nations. So you probably have seen this Stiesel coming out, this series. So let's talk a little bit about this because I'm sure that the, the audience will like very much that. <laughs> yes, well. No, um... Not yours, but maybe if you would like to say how was this born and how, you know, I'm sure it's not the first time somebody will ask is asking you to speak about the shtis. <laughs> yes, that's right. I'm very proud of uh, Ori. He's my fourth child, and uh, they are all uh, very artistic. Um, my children and and my grandchildren also are already showing their their talents in art. But Ori, I think um, when he wrote Shtisel, uh, when I read the first um, fragments of uh, the script that he let me see, I realized that he had managed to put so much of his way, his way of looking at the world into this story. Uh, choosing this family, the Stissel family, that who, who uh, as, they, as he and his friend that wrote it with him decided to call them, and by the way, you know how the name Stiesel came to be. There was a restaurant in Geula. Geula is a very uh, Haredi, ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, an old neighborhood in Jerusalem. It's where most of the series takes place, the series of Stiesel. 
that he met with his friend, Yonatan Indulski, uh, to talk about writing this series, they made an appointment to meet at that restaurant the, that, that was called Shtisel, in the heart of the neighborhood of Geula. And uh, they, uh, Ori brought the idea of the father and his uh, bachelor son who lives with him after uh, the mother of the family had passed away. And uh, he, told, he, he brought that idea. And then they started talking about different ways to develop the story. And when they realized they have to call it something, I mean, if they're, you know, when you open um, a, uh, uh, no, I, the word escaped me, in the computer, when you open uh, a, uh, when, you, when, you have, when you write something in the computer, you have to call it a name, right? So they decided to call it a temporary name, Shtisel, because they're sitting in the in the in the uh, restaurant called Shtisel, and that's how it, it it and it was a temporary name. And then when it was produced, the producers said, "It's a wonderful name. We'll keep it. We'll leave it that way." But um, I think the main reason that people. Um, uh, feel attached to this story of this family, this Orthodox family, is the same reason that we feel that we that we um, identify with characters of books, movies, series everywhere. I think characters of stories, whether they are written or filmed, touch our hearts no matter how they look where and how they live or what they believe in. As long as they are human, you know, that's the main thing. As long as they are human, as long as they make mistakes and prove that they are not perfect, God forbid. As long as they are just like each of us in their loneliness, in their longing for love and for meaning and in their constant need for assurance, we love them, we identify with them, we want to know what will happen to them next? And I think that basically we all read novels and watch films or TV mainly in order to find ourselves in other characters and to learn about our own story from other stories. I know that's why I read books. That's why I watch movies or TV series. And that is also why I write stories because through the characters, I learn about myself. It's kind of a, a self-therapy, psychological therapy for me. Whether I'm writing or reading or watching, I'm going through a process of knowing more about myself through other characters and other stories. And, uh, you know, stories can do wonders. They can even heal wounds. And the Baal Shem Tov, founder of Hasidism, used to say that whenever we cannot open the gates of heaven by praying, we can always still open them by telling a story. Which means that sometimes a story is even more than prayer. It can always open the gates of heaven and it can always open the gates of our hearts. So true. There are so many people, even important people, important people, public people, said, Shtizel, it's me. You know, this identification has been so strong. And now we all, we're all waiting for the fourth series. <laughs> so <laughs> please tell I think uh, the Italians yeah. are working. So I really hope that they're working on it. <laughs> I know uh, uh, Oli is working on something new that I think you will love no less than you love Stisa. But who knows, maybe there will, there will be a fourth season too someday. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so thank you. much for coming and speaking to the, to the Italian audience. And um, it's, uh, I, I, I really want to recommend your book because you open it and you cannot leave this book. You, you stay with Sonia, you stay with Yoel, and you stay with the story. And this is really opening 
new doors inside of each one of us. So thank you very much, Simonetta. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Be well.